All right, we're continuing with section 9.1 here. And now that we've kind of got established what a Taylor polynomial is and how to calculate one, we're just going to practice calculating a few more Taylor polynomials and then using them to make approximations for values of functions that are, by our new definition, hard to calculate. So in example two, on page five, we are supposed to find Taylor polynomials for the function f of x equals e to the x, centered at x equals zero. By the way, a quick definition for us here. When we use x equals zero as the center, and remember what I'm really doing here is defining the a value. When we use the center at zero, we sometimes call our Taylor polynomial by another name. We sometimes call it the Maclaurin polynomial. Taylor and Maclaurin are just two mathematicians that did a lot of work on these things, so that's where the names come from. All right, so general expression for the Taylor polynomial of degree n. Once again, we know that in order to calculate a Taylor polynomial, let's just write down our general formula again. P sub n is the sum as k goes from 0 to n of the nth derivative evaluated at a divided by n k factorial. I'm sorry, these should be k's, not n's. The kth derivative evaluated at a divided by k factorial times x minus a to the k power. So anytime you want Taylor polynomials, you're always going to start with that general formula. Just like last time, because I am going to need a bunch of derivatives to do this, just kind of off to the side, I'm going to make a little table of derivatives. So let's see here. For various n values, we'll list the derivative. And then we're going to evaluate it. And in this case, a equals 0. So the zeroth derivative is just the original function, e to the x, and of course e to the zero is one. Now you guys can see this one coming, right? The first derivative is, of course, still e to the x, and so when I plug in zero, I still get one. And of course, this is going to be a really nice one because we can continue Second derivative, still e to the x, still get 1, and so on. So this time, all of our derivatives are the same, and we're going to get 1 every single time. So the numerator of my fraction here is always going to be 1. All right, so let's go ahead and start writing things down. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say p sub n is going to be, and rather than writing them all separately this time, let's go ahead and just sort of do a big continuation. Putting in the k equals 0, the derivative always 1 over 0 factorial times x minus 0 for a to the 0 power. And then I'm just going to keep on going and do the k equal 1 term. So again, numerator is always 1 because this derivative is always 1 over 1 factorial times x minus 0 to the first power. And for k equal 2, derivative is still 1 over 2 factorial times x minus 0 squared. And I've got enough space, so I'll write out one more. 1 in the numerator. And then when k is 3, we'd have 3 factorial times x minus 0 cubed, and so on. So in fact, uh, I'm going to simplify not quite as much as I could, but I want to see the, the pattern so we can write this more easily. This would be 1 over 0 factorial, just x to the 0. Right? x minus 0, of course, is just x plus 1 over 1 factorial, x to the first, plus 1 over 2 factorial, x to the second, plus 1 over 3 factorial, x to the third, etc. And this is a particularly easy pattern 
right? P sub n then would be the sum as k goes from 0 to n of 1 over k factorial times x to the k power. So a really nice, fairly simple Maclaurin series or Taylor polynomial for e to the x. I'm going to pop over this time and talk about the graph right now. I do have it kind of pre-done for us on Desmos. There we go. So you can see I've got y equal e to the x graphed here in red. And if you watch these polynomials, there would be the first degree, 1 plus just x. Here's the second degree. Notice 1 over 2 factorial is still 2 times x squared has been added on. And you can see it definitely got closer to the red e to the x graph. Here's the p3. I've now added on, I can't quite see over here, but maybe if I come down here I can move over so you can see. That 1 over 3 factorial, which would be the 6 times x cubed. And this one's kind of in that purplish color, and you can see that we've gotten closer yet to the red e to the f gra x graph. And then finally down here with the p4, I've taken what I had before, and notice I've now added on, that's 1 over 4 factorial, that 24, times x to the fourth power. And there in black, you can now see that graph is really, really close to our e to the x graph. So p1, p2, p3, p4 really does get to be a better and better approximation for y equals e to the x. Especially near a equals 0. Notice all of them are identical there, here at 0, 1. And then the blue graph splits off first, and then the green, and then the purple. And the graph, the, the black one, stays a good approximation for a long time. So there we are graphically. And again, this I just sort of did on Desmos to get that graph. All right, what I want to do this time with my uh, series is I would like to compute two different values. I want to approximate e to the point 1, and then I also want to approximate e to the point 3. We're going to go ahead and complete our chart right in here. So again, just a reminder, our e to the x approximation was our series 1 plus 1 over 1 is just 1 x to the first, plus 1 over 2 factorial is 2 x squared, 1 over 3 factorial is 6 x cubed, and so on. And so I'm going to do p0, p1, p2, and p3 for these. So let me start with x equals 0 0.1. The constant, or p0 approximation, is just the first term, 1. The p1 approximation, plug in x equals 0 0.1, so just 1 plus 0 0.1, would be 1.1. 1 .1. p2, I've got to plug 0 0.1 in up to the x squared term. and I get 1.105. And then to get the P3, I have to go all the way to the end, so I'm going to take what I already had, and I'm going to add that 1 sixth times 0 0.1 is our x here, to the third power. And I got 1.105, 1, 6, 6, 6, and so on. 
bump that off to a seven at the end. All right, I'd like to know how good these approximations are. And so I'm gonna compare them to the actual value of e to the point one from the calculator. There it is, 1.10517, etc. And just to kind of, to kind of get a feel for how good the approximation is, for each of these approximations, each polynomial, P0, P1, P2, and P3, I'd like to calculate the absolute error which just means the absolute value of the difference between the true value, e to the point 1, minus the approximation pk. So, for this first one, I'm going to take e to the point 1 and subtract this approximation, which was just 1, and the absolute value of that would be 0 0.10517. And then the same thing down here. I'm going to take the actual value of e to the point 1, and I'm going to subtract 1.1. And the absolute error is 0 0.0051709, etc. And again, actual value e to the point 1 minus my approximation, 1.105. And my approximation here is in uh, scientific notation. I'm going to write that as 0 0.0001709. And then one more time, e to the point 1, subtract this approximation, 1.105, 16667. I've got 4.2 times 10 to the minus 6. So that would actually be point five zeros, and then 4.2, and so on. So, notice what this is telling us. Essentially, our accuracy at just the P3 level, right? We've only done a third degree Taylor approximation here. Is all the way out. We're only off by one, two, three, four, five. What is this? Tenths, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands. This is in the millionths place. We're off by about four millionths. That is a really, really good approximation. Now, keep in mind, we picked an x value that was really, really close to our a value. a was 0. And we picked an x value that was very close to a. So it's not surprising that we got an extremely good approximation here. Right? Let's take a look at x equals 0.3 this time. 0.3 is still really close to x equals 0, so we should still get a good approximation but it's a little further away, so I would expect my errors to be a little bit bigger than they were here. Okay. So again, P0 is just the 1. P1, if I plug in 0 0.3, 1 plus 0 0.3 would be 1.3. Uh, P2, I gotta go out to the x squared term, so I have the 1.3 plus, 1 half times our x now is 0.3 squared, 1.345. And then I'm going to add one more term, take what I got, add 1 sixth times our 0.3 to the third power, 1.3495. The actual value on the calculator of e to the point 3 
is about 1.349, 8588, etc. So again, you'll notice this is a very good approximation compared to the exact value that the calculator gives me. But once again, I'd like to go through and calculate the absolute errors. The absolute errors are going to be the exact value, e to the 0.3, minus our approximation, pk. So if I take my e to the 0.3, and subtract my first approximation, which is 1. My absolute error is 0 0.349, 8588, and so on. E to the 0.3, subtract my next approximation, 1.3, 0 0.049, 8588, etc. And I'm going to keep on going e to the 0.3 minus 1.345, 0 0.0048588. And finally, this last one, that would be 0 0.0003588. So you can see, it's still an excellent approximation, but notice, what do we got here? What are we off by? Uh, tenths, hundreds, thousands. We're now off by about three ten thousandths. Which is certainly not as good as being off by four millionths. So the fact that we've moved further away from the center, you can definitely see it in the accuracy of your approximation. Okay, let's go ahead and try another one. We've done a log, we've done an exponential, let's do a trig. This time I'd like to find Maclaurin polynomials, and notice as soon as I say Maclaurin polynomials, that automatically tells you that a is zero. And we're going to do it for the function f of x equals sine x. So I always start with my piece of n is the sum as k goes from 0 to n of the k derivative evaluated at a divided by k factorial times x minus a to the k. Start that way every single time. All right. Just like before, I'd like to kind of do my derivatives ahead of time so that I don't have to struggle for them in the middle. So n the derivative, and then we're going to evaluate it for a equals 0. So the 0th derivative is the function itself sine x. And if you plug in 0, sine of 0 is 0. First derivative. Derivative of sine x is cosine x. Plugging in 0, the cosine of 0 is 1. Second derivative is going to give us negative sine x. But when you plug in 0, we're still going to get 0. See, third derivative would be negative cosine x. And cosine of 0 is 1, so that one's negative 1. We'll go just a little bit further here. Fourth derivative would give me a negative negative, so I'm back to a positive sine x. Plugging in 0 gives us 0. None of these are going to repeat, right? The fifth derivative will be cosine x, which gives us 1. Sixth derivative will give us negative sine x, which gives us 0. And seventh derivative is going to give us negative cosine x, which gives us negative 1. And then we'll be back to sine x again, and the whole thing's going to repeat itself. 
All right, so one thing that's kind of interesting about this one, notice that every other term is going to have a zero in this numerator, meaning the whole term is going to end up being zero. So let's start writing these out. Again, I won't write out each one individually. I'll start writing out piece of n, and then we'll just know that you know each term denotes its own new piece of piece of k. So piece of n. I start with the zeroth derivative, which is zero. And I'm going to write it out. It's zero factorial times x minus zero to the zero power. Plus I'm now up to k equal 1. First derivative is 1 over 1 factorial times x minus 0 to the first. Plus, I'm up to k equal 2. Second derivative is 0 over 2 factorial x minus 0 squared. Plus, Third derivative, negative 1, over 3 factorial, x minus 0 cubed. And I know this is a little repetitive, but let's get down to the end of my chart here. Uh, for 4, we have 0 over 4 factorial, x minus 0 to the 4th. For 5, we'd have 1 over 5 factorial x minus 0 to the fifth. For 6, we're at 0 over 6 factorial, x minus 0 to the sixth. And for 7, we're at negative 1 over 7 factorial, x minus 0 to the seventh, and so on. So, a bunch of terms are going to go away entirely, right? Every time I had a zero in the numerator, that term just vanishes. So all I end up with is 1 over 1, or just 1, x to the first. Let me leave the factorials in for now. This will be a negative 1 over 3 factorial, x to the third. That one will give me a plus 1 over 5 factorial, x to the fifth. And this one will give me a minus 1 over 7 factorial, x to the seventh, and so on. Okay. So I think a pretty clear pattern. I would guess you could probably continue this pattern pretty easily. But let's see if we can write it using the sub notation. Since the zero term is zero again, I'm going to go ahead and just start this at k equal one. And here's the challenge this time. I have to figure out a way to zero out every other term. Right? So in fact, what I'll end up doing is to make an odd number. First of all, to make an even number, I'd use 2k. To make an odd number, I'm going to use 2k minus 1. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go with 1 in the numerator every single time. The denominator has to be the factorial of an odd number. So to make the odd number, I'm going to go with 2k minus 1 factorial. And then x, again, has to be raised to that odd power. So x to the 2k minus 1 power. I do still have to deal with the issue of the alternating signs, which I'll do in just a moment. But first of all, let's check this out. Notice what happens. When k is 1, that becomes 2 minus 1 is 1, and that gives me that first term. When k is 2, 4 minus 1 is 3, gives me that next term. When k is 3, 6 minus 1 gives me the 5, and so on and so on. So this is a good way to get odd numbers. All right, I have to make it alternate. 
So I do need to have a negative 1 to the maybe k, maybe k plus 1. Let's check it out. First term is supposed to be positive here. And k equals 1 right now would give me a negative. So I could just make that k plus 1. There's other ways to do it as well, but k plus 1, k minus 1 would have been fine. Just something to make that an odd power. Or an even power, excuse me, for the first term. All right. So there is my p sub n, my general formula for my Taylor polynomials. Once again, I'd like to just examine the graphs, and I'm going to do these graphs on Desmos, because it's a lot easier than trying to draw them. So I'm going to hide the ones we did before. And I probably want a different uh, setting here. Let's go from negative pi to pi. We'll do one full period of the sine function. And then on the y-axis, like negative 2 to 2 should do it. We know sine is between negative 1 and 1, so that should be sufficient. All right. So first of all, here's my sine function. Right, familiar sine wave. Here's p1, just x to the first. And you can see just that y equals x graph actually stays pretty close to the sine graph for quite a while. In fact, for really small angles in radian form, guessing that the sine of the angle is equal to the angle is quite good. The sine of point 0.1 is pretty close to point 0.1. The sine of point 0.2 is pretty close to point 0.2. That lasts for quite a while, as you can see. All right, let's add the P3 here. P2 didn't add anything new, right? There are no even powers. So for P3, I've got the minus 1 over 3 factorial, which is 6, times x cubed. And there's that one. Notice it got even better, closer to the original sine graph. Here's P5. Again, P4 wouldn't add anything new. So P5, there's 1 over 5 factorial, which is 120, times x to the fifth. And now in black, you see how long that stays really close to the original red sine curve? Kind of amazing. And then this one, I want one more. I did the minus 1 over 7 factorial, which is 50, 40, x to the seventh. And there's that blue graph. Can you see it almost covered the sine graph? If I get rid of all the others here. Look at how close P7 is to the sine wave. It's really, really close. In fact, to the accuracy of this calculation device, I can't even see the difference except way out here at the end where I can just see the red sine graph peeking through. So by P7, we have an extremely accurate approximation for the whole period from negative pi to pi, which again is pretty amazing. We've only gone to p7. All right. And I didn't have us approximating anything. We could, right? We could have plugged in a value and gotten it, but I just kind of wanted to look at the graphs on those. All right, one last problem for this section. Approximating values using Taylor series. Up until now, I've kind of defined things for you, right? I've told you, here's your function, here's your a value, find the Taylor series. In these problems, we're going to have to define our own function, and we're going to have to define our own a value. The function itself is usually not too tough to figure out. For example, here, we're trying to approximate the square root of 11. So it makes sense that we would want to choose our f of x to be the square root of x. Now I want to choose an a value. And choosing the a value requires a little bit more thought. And that's what I've kind of got listed here. You always want to choose, so this is choosing a.
you always want to choose a number that's easy to use for your function. So since my function is the square root of x, I would want to choose an a value that the square root of that a value comes out really nice and evenly, right? So something like 4, 9, 16, 25. A number whose square root I can do easily in my head. Secondly, we want to choose a number that's close to the value we're interested in. As we've seen again and again with our graphs, right, the closer we stay to the a value, the more accurate our estimate's going to be. So in this case, I'm thinking, all right, I want a number as close as possible to 11, but I want to be able to do the square root easily. So I think I'm going to go with a equal 9. That's the closest perfect square I can get to 11. We'll keep in mind that in terms of getting the estimate, we can always make it more and more accurate by using more and more terms in our Taylor polynomial. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to approximate the square root of 11 using Taylor polynomials, degree 1, 2, 3, and 4. And we'll go ahead and calculate the absolute error for each approximation to see how good a job we're doing at approximating the square root of 11. All right, before I start, I'm going to go ahead, well, actually, I should probably write down my Taylor polynomial first. P sub n is the sum as k goes from 0 to n. The kth derivative evaluated at a divided by k factorial times x minus a to the k power. And then off to the side, I'm going to do those derivatives so that I can grab them as I need them for my Taylor polynomial. So let's see here. For each k value, we'll write down what the derivative is. And then we'll evaluate it for a equal 9. The zeroth derivative is always the original function, so I'm going to write that as x to the one half, and try, and anticipating that the derivative will be easier then. And if I plug in 9, 9 to the one half, or the square root of 9 would be 3. Let's see, we want to go up to 4. So first derivative, one half, x to the negative one half. And if you want to, just because these are going to get a little uglier, we can plug in with the calculator. Uh, 1 half times 9 to the negative 1 half as a fraction is 1 sixth. Next derivative, negative 1 fourth x to the negative 3 halves. Plugging in 9, is negative 1 over 108. Third derivative is going to be a positive 3 eighths, x to the negative 5 halves. Plugging in the 9 is 1 over 648. And we've got to go up to P4, so the fourth one would be negative 15 over 16, x to the negative 7 halves. Plugging in 9 for x oh, and it doesn't want to give that one to me. Uh, that's okay. We'll be all right. Uh, negative 0.0004288. Let's call that. Close enough. 
All right, so I'm going to start building my Taylor polynomial. First of all, starting with k equals 0, my numerator is the derivative, 3 over 0 factorial times x minus my a value is 9 to the 0 power. Going to k equal 1, first derivative, 1 sixth over 1 factorial, x minus 9 to the first, plus k is 2 now, so the second derivative over 2 factorial, x minus 9 squared. k equals 3, my third derivative, over 3 factorial, x minus 9 cubed, and then finally my fourth derivative that the calculator wasn't quite ready to give me a value for as a fraction. We probably could have figured it out, but we'll be okay with this. Over 4 factorial, x minus 9 to the fourth. And of course, it would keep on going from there. All right, I didn't ask you for an ex or to write this as a sum. I didn't ask you for a general formula this time, which is probably good. This one's a little bit more challenging to get there, and that's okay. We don't actually need it. Let's just simplify a little bit to make things a little easier to plug into, and then we're going to go ahead and write our approximations for the square root of 11. So let's see here. Zero factorial is 1 and anything to the 0 is 1, so really all I have here is the 3. 1 factorial is 1, so that would be 1 sixth times x minus 9. This will be negative 1 over 108 times 2 would be 2 16. x minus 9 squared plus 3 factorial is 6, so 648 times 6 puts 3888 in the denominator. 1 over 3888. x minus 9 cubed. And then minus this one I'll just have to do as a decimal. Uh, 4 factorial is 24. So that'd be point zero zero zero. Zero, four zeros, one seven eight six. And that would be times x minus nine to the fourth. Sneak that in, etc. etc. All right, so for each of our ends, let's make ourselves a little table. We're going to go ahead and we're going to find p sub n of 11. That's our approximation for the square root of 11. And then we're also going to do the absolute error. Which would be the difference between the actual absolute value or uh, square root of 11 from the calculator minus our estimate. So, let's get those first. When n is 0, the 0 order term is just 3. When n is 1, I'd have 3 plus 1 sixth times, I'm plugging in 11, remember, so 11 minus 9. And I get 3.3 .3 repeating. When it is 2, I take what I already had, and I now have to subtract 1 over 216 times 11 minus 9 squared. All 
All right, for n equals 3, again, I take what I already had, and I'm now going to add 1 over 3888 times 11 minus 9 cubed. Three point three one six eight seven two four two seven, and then finally, when n is four, I take what I already had, and I subtract this point zero 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 one seven eight six times eleven minus nine to the fourth. Three point three one six five eight six 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 seven. All right, just for our own kind of curiosity, let's take a look at the square root of eleven on a calculator. There it is, and you can definitely see we've got the first three decimal places for sure, right? So we're we're getting there. Not a bad estimate by P four. But let's do the absolute error. If I take by square root of 11. Let's get this so you can see all this. Sorry, I just want to get this so you can see everything I need you to see. There we go. No, not quite yet. There, with the calculator visible. Square root of 11, and I just subtract the 3. Ah, I did that wrong. <laughs> it's like a square root of 11. Get out of the square root and then subtract the 3. There we go. The absolute error, 0.316625. Let's call that. Second one, square root of 11 minus 3 point, whole bunch of 3's here. Now I do take the absolute value of the error, so I'm going to call this just 0.0167085. Next one, oh my goodness, got to subtract here, Christy, come on, there we are. Absolute error is now point zero zero one eight zero nine nine eight. And just a couple more. Can I take the absolute value? So I'm going to ignore the negative. 0 0.000 24764. We'll call that one. And then the last one. Point zero 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 three eight one two three. So this one I think is a little bit interesting. Notice how we actually kind of get one more order of magnitude better with each approximation, right? The error is in the tenths place here. Error is in the hundredths. Error in the thousandths, ten thousandths, and hundred thousandths by the time we get down to n equal 4. So again, a pretty darn good approximation. All right, I know this is a really long section, but that finally brings us to the end of section 9.1 on Taylor approximations.